Good day everyone. This is the second part of a workshop on the clinical applications of TADS in orthodontics. This is a series of seven videos and the second part deals with surgical protocol for TAD insertion. Now, patient selection. TADS are contraindicated in some situ situations. Patients who are incapable of following the instructions for post-operative care, either psychologically, mentally, or neurologically, they are contraindicated. Patients with insufficient or poor bone quality, like osteoporosis, the TAD will not hold on to the bone very well. Patients with systemic alterations affecting the bone metabolism, like insulin-dependent diabetes, also don't respond very well. Although, if the patient was uh, very well monitored and uh, his, he was stable, he could be treated with TADS. Patients having received radiotherapy in the head region, and even patients with heavy smoking, yes, heavy smoking, or both of them decrease the blood supply to the bone, and therefore they are not indicated for the use of TADS. Patient selection regarding the age of the patient and uh, the optimal age is uh, above 12 to 14 years of age and that's because the bone quality becomes much better at that age but children even as young as 10 years of age can be treated and this is a case of mine in which uh, this is a 10 year old female uh, the girl had uh, the, uh, the upper incisor erupting in the direction of the lateral incisor and as you can see it has pushed its root lingually and uh, there was not much I can do except do a surgery sort of direct on the bracket put a tad and just drag that tooth to the mesial and after a month it responded very well but as you notice the tad fell that's normal because of the poor quality of bone in that young child and uh, it is a temporary device. So uh, regarding the, uh, the patient selection, uh, how old the patient should become, well, older patients, uh, it is not regulated by age, it's regulated by the thickness of the cortical plate. If the cortical plate is thick and thicker than 0.5 millimeters, then it should hold the TAD. But if it's thin, uh, much thinner than 0.5 millimeters, it is not going to hold the TAD and the TAD is going to migrate. So using a bicortical TAD in which you would insert the TAD through and through, through the TAD from one side to the other side would be indicated. Another thing is that uh, you have to choose the placement site. And the placement site should have adequate bone to cover the depth of the TAD. In addition to it should have enough to cover the width of the TAD being at least 2.5 millimeters so that it would stay away from vital structures. Possible insertion sites include in the maxilla, the area below the nasal spine, palate, alveolar process, the infrazygomatic crest, the retromolar area, and in the mandible, the alveolar process, the retromolar area, and the synthesis. Regarding the insertion site, you should try to avoid sites where there is teeth erupting or uh, deciduous roots uh, resorbing or where there are uh, roots forming of the uh, permanent teeth. All these sites, there's active bone remodeling and this will not be a stable place to implant a TAD. So sometimes when you have a case like this, and you want to implant something here, it's impossible to find a place where you can put these TADs. It's always advisable to place them in places where they're stable, and there's no bone remodeling happening at that place. Also, you should try to do it in the attached gingiva and try to stay away from the free gingiva. This free gingiva is the movable type of gingiva. And if you insert inside the movable type of gingiva, you sometimes get tearing, you get more bleeding, you get more ulceration, even failure of the implant. But if it's inevitable that you have to place it under the soft tissue, 
like in the frenum area in the upper midline then you can open the area and just uh, insert it suture it and that way you just take out uh, a coil spring or a ligature wire and attach to it something it's better than leaving it popping out here and causing more ulceration uh, because of the uh, desire to make the lower part the head come out of the free gingiva and the desire to make the screw go up inside the bone where the roots are thinner and that way it does not hit the roots it is always advisable to insert the, the pad at an angle uh, maybe about 45 degrees now regarding head selection the head selection depends on the type of tooth movement or auxiliary you're going to use if you're going to use power chain then this would be fine if you're going to thread ligature wires, you should search for one with a hole. If you're going to use a wire and uh, do some type of wire bending, then one of these would do fine, which have brackets. Another feature is the collar, the length of the collar. If you're going to use it in the palate where there's thicker soft tissue, longer collar is advisable. But in the buccal regions where there's thinner soft tissue, a short collar would be preferable. Diameter selection of these depends on the cortical bone thickness and the space between the roots. Now, if you have thick cortical plate, it is advisable to use the thick type of implant. Yes, the thick type of implant. When it's thick cortical bone, you don't need the thick for more anchorage. You need it so that it doesn't break. If you insert a thin uh, implant, inside thick bone it can break so if the bone is thin you can use thin implants if the cortical plate is thick you need thicker implants of course this is unless you're pre-drilling uh, a tunnel there and that way it uh, doesn't matter you can use whatever you like and the space between the roots also governs that if you have wider space between the roots you can use wider uh, tads and if you have shorter uh, the, the distance is smaller, then you'll have to use more. So narrow tads in general are used in the lower incisor region where the cortical plate is thin and the space between the teeth is rather narrow. Medium sized ones are generally placed in the uh, buccal areas and the palate of the upper and lower alveolar tissue, uh, the alveolar bone or in the palatal side of the upper well whereas wide ones they're placed in tough uh, thick cortical plate like in the retromotor area and you can use them as well uh, in thick thinner bone areas where there's no density now it comes when it comes to length this also depends on the cortical bone thickness if the cortical bone thickness is very thin, then we're going to rely on the, the spongy bone, the cancellous bone, to give the primary stability. And this means we need a longer uh, tad. But if we're going to use it on, with thick plates of uh, cortical bone, we don't need a long tad because they're sufficient for the job. So as a summary, the narrow Short ones are generally indicated in the lower incisor region where the space between the teeth is small and the, bone, the cortical plate is thin. The thick ones, the thick shorter ones are generally placed in places where the cortical plate is thicker like in the buccal areas of the uh, uh, upper and lower uh, alveolar process. Well, if the cortical plate is weaker, then you're going to use one of these longer ones. A thicker one would be desired where it's in a dentulous area and you need a larger, thicker one. And a thinner one will be when there is dentulous teeth and there are teeth and you do not want to pierce the roots. Also, another point is I would use the longer ones in the palatal side because of the length of the soft tissue from the palatal side. After that, you take a preapical x-ray to make sure how wide is the gap 
between the teeth in the insertion sign. If the gap is not that big, then you can do leveling first and uh, direct on the bracket, rotate it a little bit so that during leveling you're going to push the root of the 5 away from the 6 and then for open a space here for future insertion of the uh, Then you're going to locate the uh, place of the insertion. You can do that by a brass wire that's wounded or you can bend a wire and stick it with composite on the teeth and then take an x-ray and this would give you a good guide of where to insert your implant. Implants in general are placed at around 45 degrees in the maxilla but they can be placed as much as horizontal to the roots in the lower because in the lower arch the buccal shelf of bone is rather thick. It's a very nice place to insert TADs Whenever possible. When you start the insertion procedure, then you uh, the patient some analgesics, let's say an hour before the uh, surgical procedure, like paracetamol. You instruct the patient to brush his teeth well and check that uh, the teeth are clean and there's no residue of plaque or food debris. Then you can uh, make him rinse with chlorhexidine mouthwash. Um, for let's say a minute or two and uh, once everything's clean you can put a lidocaine uh, ointment or spray to numb the area and give an injection the amount of injection should be very minimal it should be 0.1 to 0.5 mil that's not exceeding a third of a carpool or a quarter of a carpool at the most but even 1 16th is enough this is only to numb the soft tissue and the periosteum because uh, the bone does not have sensory fibers. So if the patient during insertion feels pain, then this is a sign of warning that we are being very close to the periodontal ligament or even have hit the periodontal ligament and the root. So once the patient feels pain, we should consider taking the TAD out and inserting it back in again with another diagram. If you have a self-drilling type of uh, TAD, then you would consider doing a punch in which you remove this uh, soft tissue and then after removing that, you use a drill and the drill would uh, pierce the cortical plate. I do recommend using this one in thick cortical plates, but avoid to use these types which were common before because they can injure the roots piercing the cortical plate with uh, this short one is fine. It's even with self-tapping ones. Uh, sometimes if it's uh, not that thick, you can use any sharp instrument to make an indent inside the bone, which would make it easier to insert the implant. Then you take the implant from the packaging and carry it and insert it inside the screwdriver and start drilling. When you're drilling, you first drill perpendicular to the, to, to the alveolar surface because if you drill at an angle, it can slip and injure the patient. So it's better to start with a right angle. Once you have engaged the bone, then you change to the angle desired and continue drilling. During drilling, you need your hands to be steady, not wobbly, so that you do not uh, and um, affect the bone and make the path of insertion just one path and go very steadily until you have finished the insertion and the uh, collar touches the periosteum where you will feel an increase in the resistance of the uh, TAD. Do not further uh, rotate the implant because you're going to make it weaker and not stronger. Then you'll take an x-ray, a periapical one, and see if the TAD is uh, located well. It should be well away from the roots of the adjacent teeth and with adequate distance from both sides. And this means this you have a successful Lastly, I would prefer to put some type of sealant on top of it so that it doesn't injure the patient, doesn't impinge the buccal mucosa. Here I've used the light cure temporary filling material which I find it's very nice and it can be easily removed next visit because it's uh, uh, rubbery. Uh, 
this is another technique which I use which is a ligature elastic here and uh, there is on top of it a separator elastic this is especially if it's long protruding from the mucosa and could cause a lot of irritation this way this would cushion it out and this is another example for a palatal one which could be very traumatic to the tongue in the first visit now you check the stability, primary stability should be okay. When you tap it, you find it hardly attached to the bone. And this means that we have a successful insertion procedure. You should always take care to advise the patient to follow good oral hygiene instructions. You should brush the, to the implant as well as he brushes his teeth. Failure to do that will cause gingivitis around the implant and then cause implantitis and failure of the implant. Uh, you can also use uh, a soft toothbrush which is soaked into chlorhexidine or I would prefer using chlorhexidine spray or ointment and he would apply it let's say three times a day for a week or two to ensure good healing. You can use uh, for prophylaxis uh, there's the thromycine 500 milligrams uh, which I find nice because it's only prescribed uh, once a day and patients comply with that. And you can use a painkiller like uh, Panadol or Paracetol for the children and probably Ponstan or Brofin for older people. Now the last topic is the TAD removal. And TAD removal is a, a simple procedure, although it is quite delicate because uh, if you have osseointegration between the TAD and the bone, uh, the, it's going to be very difficult and even may fracture. That's why they use in manufacturing of the TAD hard titanium alloys so it doesn't fracture. They make it polished so that it does not attach to the bone, but still uh, just hold it carefully and do not uh, wobble the uh, handle and just unscrew it gradually. You do not need anesthesia to take the TAD out as it is not a painful procedure, but I would recommend using a spray anesthesia just to anesthetize the gums and the gingiva so it becomes a really pleasant procedure in which the patient does not feel any pain at all. Post uh, removing, it does not need any care because it's such a small hole and it will heal automatically. Sometimes, especially in the buccal uh, area of the maxilla, you would find an indent uh, residue of fibrous tissue where the, the TAD was inserted. Sometimes you find no such indent because it just uh, goes away. And thank you for your kind listening. If you found this information useful, I do recommend that you share it with your friends and uh, your colleagues. I do like if you could like the uh, video and uh, if you would like to see future videos which I've linked in the description below, please subscribe to the channel. Thank you for your kind listening.